Um, as Liz said, I'm based in Toowoomba, um, part of a GRDC funded project, IDM project, which is uh, working on sunflower sorghum pulses and nematodes, and I do the sunflower component. Um, also in our project is Murray Sharman's virology work, and uh, he works on TSV uh, across a lot of crops, including sunflower. So part of my work also uh, revolves around surveillance, and the aim of that is to uh, both look for biosecurity um, issues and also biodiversity um, information. And what we do, all these little black um, circles are the wild sunflower populations. So you guys are very familiar with wild sunnies in your region. And the good thing about them, even though they're considered a weed, is they're a source of resistant genes for a lot of um, diseases of uh, sunnies, of hybrid sunnies. So a couple of years ago, we went around all these regions collecting seed with some American scientists and they've been um, putting the disease resi resistance genes they found in a lot of these wild populations into hybrid sunnies over in the US and they've found um, sclerotinia, downy mildew um, and rust resistance genes in the wilds. So today, uh, my module overview, uh, I'll just keep it really brief because the information's in, um, in your um, printed work. Um, it's just a snapshot. Um, there's new data I haven't got in the module, so um, if anyone wants to uh, talk to me later about anything, feel free. Um, basically, it's about providing an accurate diagnosis and how to go about it. Look, having a quick look at the diseases of sunnies or the potential diseases of sunnies and how to manage them. Bit of a quiz at the end. And I've also got a demo, uh, just a, a dinolite here. I don't, a lot of you are probably already aware of dinolites, but I find this terrific in the field. You can take a photo, it's like a mini microscope, plug it into your computer, send it off to um, any specialist, whether it be an in insect, weed, or um, pathologist. The other really good tools are the ute guides. I've got a few over on a table over there. This is a sunflower one. Uh, these are really great uh, in the field as well. So with IDM, Integrated Disease Management, the f it, that's about knowing your disease risk. And to know your disease risk, you need to know your pathogens of both the host crop that you're uh, intending to plant and also the pathogens of your other rotational crops. So familiarise, sorry, familiarise yourselves with um, the, ho the crop host disease spectrums of all, all the crops in your um, rotational uh, choices. Loretta talks about um, nutrition. What we find with diseases is um, nitrogen uh, in particular, increased nitrogen or excess nitrogen will give you an increased canopy and that makes the microclimate under the canopy more ideal for diseases. So once again, it's all about a compromise with uh, what you apply to your crop and for what reason. So long um, plant stress leads generally to increased um, disease incidence in your um, crop. And um, but, oh yes, uh, alternative hosts are another thing to keep in mind. With uh, a lot of the diseases have a huge host range, not just in crops but in weeds. So <coughs> keep the channels clean and um, edges of crops and all that stuff. So in the field, anyone that's done any um, d diagnostics in the field knows how difficult it can be. I often work into, walk into a crop after 20 years in sunny and just think I've got no idea of what the problem is. So then it's about, well, first thing you work out is what it isn't and um, then work your way towards what it is. So you take a whole plant um, overview, a whole field and then a whole locality overview. This year in the, on the plains there's been issues with uh, lower yields in the late plant and I was asked if it could be disease. If it's across a whole region, it's highly unlikely that it's a disease because you usually <coughs> will find if it's a disease it'll be localised but not across a region. If it's across the region it'll be something abiotic, maybe rain at flowering or um, um, heat stress at uh, the wrong time, things like that. 
So basically you're a GP if you're an advisor. You're a GP, you need to go in, ask questions about paddock history, herbicide history, all, everything that you can think of, ask questions and, and you'll soon find that the, um, the answers, um, or at least a short list becomes available to you. So you'll be looking at things like diseases versus herbicide damage or nutritional disorders versus disease. Um, symptoms may be different if you're plant a with your plant age and um, the best thing for us is if you want to send photos, we can, it gives us a starting point. And, uh, or if you send it around to your own advisor groups, uh, networking is a really good way to um, get an answer. So this is an example of knowing your region and knowing your paddock history and knowing what's happened. Um, this was a crop at Kununurra. The grower told me his entire crop had lodged and I thought, shit, you know, that sounds pretty bad. When I got there, it was obvious that it wasn't a disease. Um, has anyone got any ideas about what may have happened to that crop? Um, pardon? Yeah, well, almost. It, it, was, a, it was about um, late flowering. It was an irrigated crop in the first place. Its root fall was about this big per plant. So it had never put down its tap root. Um, then we got a ton of rain, followed by a ton of wind. And as you can see, they're all lying in the one direction. So basically it just fell over and they lost a lot. This crop over the behind it was fine because it was planted at a different time and it wasn't actually irrigated. But just, just the... Oh, hmm? I just thought you gave them a batch of some kind of vegetable. You can't see the photos very well? Oh, okay. Because if, you, if they get a lot of water early, they don't have to go out seeking. So that's a problem with irrigated crops. If, water, if you water early, the, the roots don't go seeking, they don't need to, they basically just get lazy. So that's why Loretta, one of the reasons Loretta was saying wait until, you know, maybe budding or flowering to water if you can. Yeah, yeah, well this, uh, this grower, he had a very high plant stand because he was irrigating. So they were um, terribly tall. And um, yeah, everything was just went wrong. Yeah, yeah, and that's a, and with diagnostics, it often is a combination and not just one thing. What colour does that look like to everybody? To orange. Hmm. Well, actually, no, it wasn't birds. It was um, it was a mixture of um, this is. This is about knowing how your host grows, in this case sunflower. I don't know that you'd be able to see it on these slides, but that's the edge of the capitulum or your head. The little st uh, stigmas have come out. What they do, they, they come out through um, the floret and open up into like a T. And once they're opened, the um, pollen, these are ones that aren't open yet, so the pollen will land on the top of the tea, fertilise the stigma, grow down and create a seed. So what happened in this case, at flowering, we had about a week, this particular plant had a lot of issues, but we had a week of wet uh, conditions followed by heat, really bad heat. And the way it was actually uh, sitting um, meant that it was an irregular sort of seed set. But usually if there's a seed set problem, it's in rows of say three or four because they come out on the one day and then if you've got rain the next day, there'll be another three or four that haven't set seed and things like that. That's one way of figuring out if it's poor seed set due to either rain, because rain deactivates the pollen. When, you're, when we're doing crosses, um, we, we deliberately spray uh, water from a little squirt bottle onto the head to de deactivate the pollen. So any rain or humidity, you'll find you have poor seed set if it's at the wrong time. Another example of confusing symptoms, um, obviously herbicide, another one, any ideas? 
this one was spray seed drift. Um, the, he, he didn't think it was herbicide because he hadn't sprayed any herbicide on his crop. But he had sprayed, or one of his men had sprayed a, uh, about mm, 50 or 100 yards away, up, up a, along a channel. And uh, it, it had drifted, basically. Look, from the distance, it looked like powdery mildew. This one here is a natural phenom phenomenon. Um, just uh, looks a bit like a virus. But uh, that particular line just, just did that oh, um, often. So if you're unsure of a diagnosis, start with your ute guide. Use your hand lens. I've got some over there if anyone would like one. Send photos. Don't hesitate to ask for help because that's what we're all here for. Keep your samples out of the sun. Preferably, it uh, depends on how quickly you're going to get them there. If it's overnight, in plastic is fine. Um, if you're worried, do some in plastic, some in um, uh, paper. And send them overnight if you can. And use your Dynalite to take photos as well. So what we found in the last few years in pathology is there's been an increase in stubble-borne pathogens. So it's coincided with basically zero and minimum till increase, increased um, sort of uh, the way everyone has chosen to um, basically not plough these days. Um, but the um, moisture sa savings are great, compaction's great, lack of compaction. But you have um, glyphosate resistance increasing and you have pathogens increasing. So, sorry, um, things like Phomopsis stem canker, all these here are all um, stubble-borne pathogens. If you're a wheat grower as well as um, sunnies, you'll have noticed maybe white grain or fusarium on wheat and sorghum have increased. Foma or ascochyta in chickpeas has really increased. Sclerotinia in a ton of crops such as uh, canola and sunnies, any Excuse me, any broadleaf uh, sclerotinia has been taking off. So in the future, it's possible that there might be a role for strategic burial, and maybe not deep burial, but even something like a Kelly chain that breaks the stubble up. This particular crop here had a Phomopsis outbreak three years ago. Um, I could still find viable fruiting bodies on stubble in this paddock three years later. So this grower chose not to, um, he, had, he had zero till practices. So with Sclero, yep. Kelly Chain, Kelly Barrow, mm. is that enough to get It helps, yeah. Anything that helps the stubble break down quicker. In Europe, they, they recommend up to 15 centimetres of deep burial. <coughs> of course, we don't do that over here. But they've got, you know, freezing winters and things like that. But I started a stubble trial um, last year and even, even five centimetres made a difference because it, it just um, breaks down so much quicker once it's under the soil. But sclerol will last for up to 10 years if it's on the top. Dep yeah, burning depends on the heat. Different stubbles uh, produce different heat. So um, it if the sclerotes are small, it'll have some impact, but overall burning is not considered a good control move. But it, it helps with things like fusariums. A lot of guys down south where we just came from have been um, starting to burn their sorghum and wheat stubble. But when, you know... Yeah, see that, that's amazing, isn't it? A few years ago that was considered a no-no. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, the old the old fellas used to always scarify too for the for the diseases and yeah. so. Yeah. All right, rust. If you're younger than me, you've probably never seen it because the seed companies have got some terrific lines these days for rust tolerance and rust resistance. This photo was taken in the 90s up in CQ. Um, that's how bad rust can get. So I put it up because you just have to be vigilant. Um, I've got over 120 races of rust identified. Um, 
there's not even any rust in the walls at the moment. So that shows me that um, it's more an environmental thing than, than a, every single wall plant being resistant. So just be careful. Uh, confectionery lines and bird seed lines it, on the whole, more susceptible. Um, the hybrids that Loretta had up, um, they're pretty good. So um, I haven't seen a pustule on a hybrid for the about probably last five years in the field. So um, yeah, I basically told you all that. It's important to monitor and uh, just see what's out there and keep an eye on it. If you do think you've got rust, rub your finger. They're usually uh, behind the leaf. So rub your finger on the back of the leaf and if it's rust, it will uh, obviously leave, leave a brown residue. If it's something like Alternaria, you'll get nothing or any of the other seed uh, leaf pathogens. Powdery is on the increase. Um, this particular species, Golovinomyces chicoraceiarum, is specific to Asteraceae, which is a sunflower type. So if you see you've got uh, powdery on your mung beans, grapevines <coughs> and sunflower all at the same time, it's not the same species. It hasn't moved from one to the other. They're all different species. They just like the same conditions, so they'll come in at the same time. Just gives you an example of the species there. So basically likes coolish conditions, which is why you find it towards the end of the season. Likes low light, high humidity, but dislikes free water. So if you water over the top, if you've got a center pivot, um, the, actual, the water actually kills the spores, but powdery actually grows over the top of a leaf. So free water will kill the spores that are sitting up on these little stalks like that. But as soon as the rain dissipates and dry, everything dries out, the humidity is uh, really intense and you just get this massive spore release. The important thing with powdery is if you've got any powdery at all, monitor at least weekly because it can explode. Life cycle is about five to seven days under um, ideal conditions. So if you haven't been there for a week, you can have a bit of white on the bottom leaves and next minute you walk in and it's like that. And if it's past the ray floret stage, 5% uh, ray floret stage, you won't be able to spray. I'm working on uh, trials uh, now to look at uh, yield decrease and also the effect on oils. So we have a, an emergency use permit till 2014 for tilt, but you have to be careful that you don't spray later than 5% ray floret emergence. That means 5 and 100, that's 5%. Five in a hundred plants in your field are showing yellow. That's the cutoff for applying tilt. An example of what a, you know, often you'll get a, a mixed, or you shouldn't, I guess, ideally, but often there'll be a mix of um, maturity types in the field. So management strategies overseas say water early. I think uh, Loretta was saying water late. But for diseases, if you can stop the humidity, the night humidity, that will help decrease disease in the crop or increase overnight. Um, yeah, like I, I said before about the nitrogen, um, increase your biomass, increase your microclimate or my favorite. So it's not seed borne. It doesn't cause poor, poor seed set. This is uh, Trevor Philp's photo. You can see around the edge here, tons of powdery on the, on the bracts, but uh, plenty, plenty of seed in the head, but these, they were starting to pinch a little. So new seed and uh, pack seeds have supported me uh, with seed for the trials I've been doing so far. Uh, done two trials looking at yield loss. There's a heap of um, looking at timing and um, rate of application, I won't bore you with all these. Basically 250, 250 mils or 500 have turned out to be the ideal and sprayed only once is all you need. So I looked at low canopy, middle and high. <coughs> yeah. And the only thing I want to show you here is this is the knockdown on the bottom third when we applied it at 5% ray flower emergence. Works really well. In the middle, control, 
that uh, nearly 100% of the canopy was um, covered in the uh, untreated. But these ones down here, uh, one spray at 500 mil per hectare, uh, one spray at 250 mils per hectare, and these ones right next to the one spray are two sprays. So what, what this is saying is you don't get any advantage by putting two sprays on starting early. Like a lot of other crops, they say uh, for powdery spray at first sign. So it doesn't work like that with sunnies. You hold off and uh, wait until the ray fold emergence stage, unless it's very intense early, which usually isn't. One spray at ray fold emergence will get you through. Once again, one at 250, one at 500. I recommend 500 rather than 250 uh, for field situations simply because at that ray flora emergence stage, you don't know how bad it's going to get. So you may as well assume it's going to be um, intense, particularly if you look around uh, your neighbour neighbours and the rest of the region. If you've got powdery in other crops, assume that it's likely that powdery, powdery will increase in your crop. This will give you, just give you an idea, this is uh, the just to show you that till actually works. It's a trial of hermitage just harvested. The other plus is this was sprayed four times. So the aim of that was to see if there's any um, uh, adverse effects of tilt and it's quite safe. I don't know if you can see there, but uh, we had guard rows on the outside, totally covered. This is a um, untreated plot and this one here um, had one spray. Yields, no significant difference. Uh, I think it, well I know it does have a, have a make a difference, but it depends on the timing of when it comes in. If it comes in early and you've got solid infection throughout your crop, uh, throughout most of the growing season, you'll get a, a yield decrease because I've seen it in the field. But in these trials we got it, it came in probably about budding, late budding, and then just sat for um, a couple of weeks without doing anything. So we didn't have a yield decrease. So as a summary, just one, one, one well-timed application at uh, 250 or 500 mils, no later than 5% ray flow emergence will get you through. You'll hardly have any um, um, powdery in, in the top or middle third. You might still have a little bit on the bottom, but that's only because uh, application, you can't actually get it through through the canopy. Um, none of this is about scaring you. This is just another pathogen that uh, is increasing. And I know you guys have got it around the plains here. Um, that one's at Kingsthorpe. And this one is one of Loretta's from Spring Ridge. This is a typical um, symptoms in that it's kind of a circular patch of lodging. Loretta described this as ute-sized patches in the field, and this was uh, bigger than that at Kingsthorpe. So I'd say there was an infection event, and it's just ascospores have sprayed out and uh, infected a big uh, patch of sunnies there. If you look in the uh, ute guide, Phomopsis uh, helianthi is an exotic and uh, biosecurity uh, risk. We don't have that. It's a, one, a new species, previously undescribed, but it does pretty well with simil similar things to Phomopsis helianthi. Leaf inf uh, it um, infects from the margin of the leaf and you get a, a brown blotch. That one's also got powdery, obviously. Grows up through the PDL to the node and eats out the pith behind the node, which is why um, as the plants start to fill, you'll get mid-stem lodging. Overseas, they've got up to 40 or 50 percent yield loss, um, so it's something to be watched, and um, we're doing a fair bit of work on it. See here, losing your, your pith. It'll survive in the stubble for up to five years. This is all uh, European or American data. Lodging is more severe if you've got thinner stems. I looked at about 10 crops down here um, a couple of months ago. The only one that was lodging was um, one a crop that uh, was very densely planted and had very thin stems and it, it had lodged. The others were all standing with the lesions. 
there were, there's quite likely to have been yield loss because of the pith damage, but at least they weren't lodged and you could get some yield off it. A bit more on the symptoms. Characteristic brown, the brown uh, lesions dotted at the nodes is characteristic. You'll also see foma, which is a black lesion, kind of about that size, often quite shiny. That doesn't cause pith damage in Australia, but Phomopsis is brown, elongated, and does cause the damage. Survives on seed and stubble, as I said. Likes the warm, wet conditions. Fruiting bodies on the stubble, and this is on florets. Uh, so um, old bits of head are just as much of a risk. I found it off hybrids and wilds, and distribution is broadening. Found it down on the hay plains, uh, up as far as Childers, uh, out as far as Delacca, and I haven't been up any further yet to see if it's up around the Burdekin. So three, three new species, Diapore the Eel from Opsis, Gouye, Kongii and Cockmanii were the names that have been given to them. And this is the stuff that Liz was talking about that they had me talk about over in uh, Argentina because it's really important to know what species you've got because they've been breeding resistant lines for Phomopsis helianthi because they assumed that all Phomopsis species that were on sunflower were helianthi. Now we know that there's at least three others and that stuff basically stuffs up their breeding program. So they've got to start a lot of other selections using our species. Um, you probably can't read that by the look of it, but uh, been um, doing a trial, uh, looking at tolerance or resistance in the hybrids. All the seed companies have looked, um, given me lines, so there's 30 accessions in it, just to see if there are any differences between tolerance and resistance in our Australian germplasm. Basically, don't plant sunflower after sunflower, or, and that's the same strategy for um, sclerotinia or any other pathogen, really. Um, yeah, well usually the fruiting bodies don't develop till after a period of cold weather. So if your neighbour has Phomopsis lesions this summer, um, it's unlikely that will produce ask spores and go into your crop if it's younger. Overseas it says that you need the cold weather for the fruiting bodies to develop and then the spring plant then is at risk if there's stubble on the ground. But we're working on that. It could be different over here. But yeah, not sure, but that's how it looks. The Russians reckon ascospores will travel a thousand kilometres, but I don't know how they figured that out. It could have come from anywhere, but that, that was what they, they reckon. So you can see here, that particular line is quite um, still green. These are very um, senesced. And what you notice in the field, if you walk through and you've got lesions, the ones severely affected will have senesced early. Their heads will sometimes be a bit crinkled. And it's all to do with water um, and nutrients not coming up through the stem. Yeah, that's a trial at Gatton. Even got ornamentals in there, which is always nice. And there's your um, foma versus phomopsis. These are usually, that, that's typical black, shiny lesions and these ones can go from brown to brown black, but more oblong. Alternaria, I know you had some of this early in the season this year. Stem lesions look like a kid has got out in the crop and um, just drawn black lines all over your stems. This is a typical uh, leaf lesion, uh, leaf lesions in that they're often small with a halo, but for some varieties, you'll get this where they all join together and uh, cause a blight. And you can end up total defoli totally defoliated if uh, you have a period of wet weather and you've got inoculum in the region. This is all alternaria, just different sort of uh, symptoms because of different age of the plants or different intensities. That's what can happen to your crop with um, severe alternaria. It's, uh, it doesn't usually happen, but it can. Sclerotinia is a big one now. Um, this crop was, uh, oh, sorry, 
six croppers around Clifton, this particular grower, uh, used to park his equipment near a shed and um, around his shed there was a tonne of inoculum which was then spread outwards from that shed. So you look for a pale lesion at the base. You walk in and you've got um, the plants hanging down and it's, you'll see a pale whitish sort of lesion at the base if it's sclerotinia minor. If it's sclerodium rolfsii, which likes warmer conditions, like Maury around there, you'll get uh, rolfsii and that's increased and it's got a brown sclerote. These ones have a black sclerote. Sclerotinia sclerodiorum, you <coughs> will find shredding as it gets quite advanced. White mycelium or fungal growth on the stems with black lumpy bits growing out. And then there's the sclerotes down there look like mouse droppings. So that's an easy ID if it's an advanced lesion, but if it's not, you've just got to go on colour and, and where it is on the stem. Stem infection, I mean um, head infection, uh, very white fluffy growth and sort of uh, sloppy soft back on your head. Can be confused with rhizopus. You'll know the difference because rhizopus is secondary pathogen and it'll only grow if you've got uh, grub damage or uh, rougher than bug damage and then moisture gets in. These ones are pathogenic. That means they actively um, attack the plant. These ones are saprophytic, which means they get in when someone else is attacked. So sclerotes can infect via the roots when then, and then you get the basal lesion or it can, they can um, get fired up as, with ascospores. That's a sclerote, looks like a seed in this photo but it's a little black, I've got some over the back there. Puts up an apothecium, a little funnel and then fires out spores and you can see there there's millions of them. So if you've got a dense canopy such as in an irrigated crop and you've got sclero in your soil, Ideal. Um, Kevin Charlesworth, where is he? Um, Kevin, what the, he was doing the harvesting module. I've got a sclerotinia site at his place. Every single plant was infected with a basal lesion. He managed to harvest um, off it because it came in late, but 100% infection. Because he'd been a bit naughty and he'd grown nine crops in a row. It's a good trial site for me. So sclerotes, sclerotinia minor, sort of a small um, um, sclerote, but little black things. These ones, chunkier, and often poking out of the, um, the stem with a white sort of bleached area on the stem. Comparison, macrofamina, that's charcoal rot, like uh, pepper in your pith. That's what they can do, uh, just totally fill up your stem with sclerotes, brown ones for Rolf's eye. That's where your hand lens comes in. Management, rotate away from sunnies, Ro rotate away from all broad leaves, canola, mung beans, chickpeas, anything that isn't a grass or cereal crop. If you've got sclerotinia, um, don't put in a don't put in a broadleaf. Uh, weed control is really important. There's 500 or 600 hosts um, for sclerotinia, all of sclerotinias. So uh, a lot of them are weeds. The chickpea crop. Um, next year the grower put in uh, sunnies and ended up with patches of sclero. Here's Kevin's crop where I've got a trial going in uh, later in the year. But, oh, sorry. Down here you can see these, these particular stems. There's a stem lesion, uh, absolutely chockers with uh, sclerotes. So when the, um, when the harrows or whatever equipment that you're driving through hits these, they just fire out and you end up with a big patch of sclerotes in your paddock. Back to rhizopus for a minute. 
these, these particular heads had uh, heliocavalverpa damage early and then rain late and developed a lot of head rot. So the importance of uh, knowing the whole site overview, to give you an example, this is an ornamental uh, seed production block. Every single head in these four rows, the length of the paddock, was rotten like that um, because the grower had uh, not monitored for insects and then had a, a big rain event. Um, he realised what was happening and then protected the next planting. So these, these particular heads had no infection whatsoever. Give you the heads up on TSV, even though you don't have it down here. The reason um, it, I'm tell, I'll tell you about it is just for vigilance, really. CQ had a big problem with TSV a few years ago, nearly uh, stopped um, sunflower production up there. Uh, Murray Sharman's done this work. He's uh, looked at all the hybrids. They now know which hybrids to plant up there, um, and the industry is now taking off again. So all the seed companies have hybrids that. Um, suit CQ. It looks a bit like herbicide damage. But the thing about uh, TSV is, I'll just slip over to it. Um, this was in CQ. Um, when you walk into that, you think herbicide damage, I reckon. That's what I thought anyway. Um, if you don't have a host, there's a host, there's Parthenium. Down here, if you walk into something like that and you don't have the host and you don't have the thrip vector, it's unlikely it'll be um, TSV. So what happens? The Parthenium is asymptomatic. So that means you can't see it's got a virus. Um, a thrip comes along, carries the pollen literally on its body over to the sunflower scarifies the leaves of the sunflower, deposits just by accident the pollen, the infected pollen, onto the leaf. Um, it goes into the sunflower leaf and you end up with those black streaks. So it's knowing your whole field uh, locality is important. If you think you might have TSV, it's highly unlikely you do if you haven't got the host and you haven't got the thrip. So the major sources up in uh, CQ are Parthenium and Crown Bed. Parthenium's been identified as far south as Victoria, but infected plants have only been in, um, found as far south as Esk, which is just north of Brisbane. So up in CQ, what they do is they, uh, they don't plant in the really intense, intensely um, weedy areas anymore. Um, they plant in areas but don't, that don't have Parthenium and they use tolerant lines. And it's been a very successful strategy. So basically, if you've got sclero or rolsii or any of the sclerotinias, you rotate away into um, cereals or maize or sorghum. If you've got phomopsis, same. Anything that's to do with stubble-borne pathogens, you re re um, you've got to rotate away and try and break up that stubble as much as you can. Stubble management's the key to managing buildup of some of these pathogens. Um, remember that tilt you only, um, only can spray up to 5% ray florid emergence. And keep in mind the biology of all your pathogens and your hosts when you are considering your rotational choices. The other good thing about sunnies is they're really tolerant or almost resistant to nematodes. So they're a great break crop. Um, for also for fusarium, it's not, not susceptible to crown rot, or the sorghum lodging fusariums, and also not susceptible for foma, of to t foma of chickpeas. And that's it. Thank you. With the high value crops like sunny, is there any work done on rock wolves and those sort of products that may help prosperity? There's a product just coming out now, might have already be out, that's being registered for sclero on canola. So theoretically, it's possible that that one might be useful. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's registered, but I know it's in the pipeline. Mm. But
But you know, that's you don't really want to have to spray. But if you have to, I guess. But yeah. So that'd be useful because there's a lot of sclero in uh, canola down in this region, but and sa same down um, in the MIA. Um, with the with the quiz, I'm just going to um, just give you a minute just to look at some photos and then give the answer straight away, and then uh, move on to the next one. Anyone got any ideas? Yeah, it is all. Yep. Yeah. Um, the stem and um, necrotic leaves, the blighted leaves, and the more typical light infection. Yeah. They haven't come up very well here. So if you've got stubble and you've had alternaria in your old crop or your neighbour has, what's the best way, the best strategy to minimise the risk to the younger crop? There was an example of this on the plains um, this year. Would you leave it standing as a bit of a windbreak? Would you apply tilt? Would you hope it doesn't rain because rain is what couple of days of rain it'll explode or do you bury or process the stubble in some way so if you can do something with your stubble that's the ideal so rust any ideas If you've rubbed your finger, it's not so easy to tell probably, but you'd have to rub your finger on the back of those. If you use your, um, uh, what's it called, hand lens, use your hand lens, um, you'll soon see the little pustules upraised under the, under the leaves. So the answer is A. So for Mopsis, any ideas? There's four different, leaf, uh, four different stem lesions there. The key to Phomopsis is it's brown. Think about brown. Um, if, it's, if it's a black lesion, it could be alternaria. It could be foma. If it's a long black streak, which is highly unlikely down here at this stage, TSV. And this is brown, but it's started to go black in the center, which can happen with Phomopsis. It starts off brown and then darkens up. Well, it can, it doesn't always. And then we have here sclerotinia with the sclerotes starting to come out of the stem and the fungal growth. So photo B is the answer. So if you've got contract headers or uh, working in the region or you're moving your own machinery from paddock to paddock or property to property, what's, what poses the greatest risk to other crops? All of them. Yeah, all of them. Even if it's just weeds, they could be carrying sclerotes. So you've got sclero. What would be poor choices? If you've got sclero in your rotation, like you might get away with uh, planting a broadleaf after broadleaf if if the um, season is reasonably dry. But if you get uh, too much moisture, that's when sclero will take off. So any broadleaves would be the wrong choices. So which, don't, which pathogen does not survive in stubble? We know that uh, oh, the sclerotes do, Phomopsis does, 
Sclerodium rolsii does, but powdery is an obligate parasite. That means it must have green leaf to survive. So the answer is powdery. A powdery mildew infection often a secondary thing, like associated with insect pressure people? Not as far as I know. No. Sometimes if your crop is stressed, it's susceptible to more pathogens, I guess. So if you've had a massive insect infection, maybe, but I would say not. It's airborne, so it usually uh, just comes in depending on the environmental conditions. Yeah, not usually associated with anything insect. So you've got a late season budding sunflower crop. When you are contemplating what you're going to do about uh, powdery, when would be the latest stage of growth that you could think about applying tilt if you thought you were going to have to apply a fungicide? <coughs> Has anyone got any ideas? 5%? That's great. And how would you minimise the chances of this rhizothus issue happening again? Probably can't see. Uh, probably can't see what this middle one is. This is actually uh, Heliocaverpa um, with a shield bug um, eating it, but can't really see it on this. <laughs> anyway, it's irrelevant. Yeah, the monitoring is the key to insect damage. And last one, any ideas um, which one is parthenium? Because if you think you might have TSV, you need to know whether or not you're looking at parthenium. Yeah, D's parthenium. Um, Vicky considers it looking like um, baby's breath. <coughs> Tiny little white flowers. It can be a scrawny plant like that, or it can be a very dense plant up to about waist high. And that's it. Thank you.